Okay, so now we're rolling again. Finally. Now, where did I leave off? I left the yeah, off. Yes. Now, we restoration. century. Latin is introduced as the primary language of the liturgy. Fourth century, the uh, persecutions end. This is where the crossbreed of Gregorian chant occurs, cross between the Roman and Gallican chants. it, the, the dough and the fall clefts, and the Guidonian hand. Also in the ninth century, Musica and Kiriades, musical treatise that talks about the, f uh, the first musical treatise that talks about polyphony in the um, Organum with the uh, daisy notation. And uh, we have the 12th and 13th centuries. This is where we're going to start picking up polyphony. Notre Dame. Oops. Part two, decadence and restoration. Oddly enough, the first and principal cause of its decadence was its materialization, that is, music actually being written down. Um, musical notation having been born in and throughout the 9th, 10th, and 11th centuries, the musical theoreticians of that time would strive to perfect this musical notation. The 
first manuscripts lacked the ability to indicate any exact pitch or intervals, and the scribes were content with simply drawing the melodic shape and some melodic uh, rhythmic subtleties, because that was all that was needed during a time of oral tradition, oral transmission. But little by little, the theorists and scribes, fascinated and intrigued by this new ability to write down music, became more and more focused on perfecting this notation and more and more focused on the melody, the exact height, exact pitch, values of intervals, etc. A comparison of ancient manuscripts shows that these different requirements led to the neglect of rhythm and other musical nuances. The second cause of its decadence were the tropes. What is a trope? Trope in Gregorian chant. In Gregorian chant, there exist pure vocalizations, such as the opening offertory of Ave Maria, um, which has a long uh, melisma. And to make a trope is to insert the text into this vocalization to describe the text further, which they take in, in, in the melisma, they fill it in with. Archangelica Mariam, Famina, Salutantia, Sic Fantur, Ave Maris Celi, Terre Orbis, Serenatrix Maria, which, uh, general, loose translation, the Archangel saluted Mary in familiar conversation, thus speaking truly, Hail Mary, the heavens, the entire world, uh, I'm not sure how to translate, Renatrix Mary, pregnant yet untouched and by God full of grace. have the offertory. seen up, up until this point are the isons and organum. Uh, eson being the drone, organum being parallel melody and uh, intervals of the fifth. But in the 13th century Paris, at the Cathedral of Notre Dame, this was about to change. If the birth of musical notation and Gregorian chant marks the first, greatest, and most important event in the history of music, the Notre Dame School of Polyphony in the 13th century marks the second. In Notre Dame of Paris, there is a 13th century book known as the Magnus Liber, which is a compilation of music composed in the 12th and 13th centuries. 
This is the same time that the great Gothic cathedral of Notre Dame is being built. A whole new era of architecture and art is emerging, and music is no exception. According to the fourth anonymous ancient biographer of these composers, Anonymous IV, the first composer of a brand new form of harmonic music with three parts is known as Léonin and his successor, Perrotin. Before them, all that was known was pure chant or simple two-part harmonies such as Isanorgan, which were merely to support the main melody and sung with free rhythm. Now comes the birth of the first form of true polyphony, three and four part uh, voices in a more regulated rhythm. Now imagine being a parishioner at this time in the 13th century, and all you've heard is single, you know, Gregorian chant. And if at all, any uh, harmony at all, you would have heard only simple Isan and Morgana. Now you walk into this amazing new Gothic cathedral, and you hear uh, Leonin or Perrotin's Bidero Dantines, which is their polyphonic version of the Bidero uh, Dantines. I think it's the off, no, the uh, Gradual for Christmas. If I'm not mistaken. And here. This is Leona.
Well, no, what, what they do is they sing Viderunt, and then they, they, that's the only polyphonic part, then they jump into um, the, the next part. Uh, they go back to the playing chant. Opposite of what some of the other ones do now when they start having right. chant. And, and then, the exactly. Board. The Bishop of Chartres, uh, who would attend the Cathedral of Notre Dame during this time, gave this first-hand description of what he heard and thought of Léonard and Perrotin's music. That which is most tuneful among the birds cannot equal them. Hearing the soft harmonies of the various singers, some taking the high parts and others the low, some singing in advance, others following in the rear, you would think yourself listening to a concert of sirens rather than men wonder at the power of voices. Such is their skill in running up and down the scales, so wonderful the shortening or multiplying of notes, perhaps a reference to the musica ficta, the repetition or emphatic utterance of the phrases. The treble and sure notes are so mixed with the tenor and the bass that all that the ears lose all power of judgment. When this is taken to excess, it is more fitting to excite the lust than devotion. But if it is kept within the bounds of moderation, it drives care away from the soul, confers joy, peace, and exaltation in God, and transports the soul to the society of angels. Composers and musicians of all forms were naturally mesmerized by this new music and were eager to experiment with it further. This eventually led to the beginning of the Ars Nova and Renaissance, where four, five, and six part polyphony began to appear in abundance. After the Council of Trent in the middle of the 16th century, 1545 to 1563, Gregorian chant entered upon a period of reforms, so-called reforms, regarding both editions and performance. Due to fascination with polyphony, which naturally required metrical rhythm, Gregorian chant had gradually become more metrical and the art of singing it was lost. Therefore, the Renaissance and its humanists took it upon themselves to make systematic corrections of the melodies, subjecting them to rules of classical Latin, which was different from the Latin that preceded it by a few hundred years. Classical Latin is the way they understood it at that time. They displaced the Latin accents, cutting out the long melismas, etc. They noticed that in certain chants, on certain words, there was only one note, on an accented syllable, and a melisma on a non-accented syllable. And they thought, well, this must be uh, some kind of mistake, and they corrected it. In addition, the long melismas, which had become tiresome since the art of singing in them had been lost, they were cut, being left with only a few notes. These reformed books then became official and replaced in every church. What this caused was as Don Guéranger himself described the manner of chanting during his own time, it became a, quote, heavy, boring succession of square notes, incapable of inspiring a single feeling and saying nothing to the soul. So, so this, this is what time period? Well, the, um, but all these truncations and Distorting of the melodies uh, really happened around the Council of Trent. Um, this is from the 12th, 13th century. Um, this is a 16th century chant book. Um, these are chants for uh, Palm Sunday. Cum audicet populos quia Jesus veniti rosum imam ac cepelunt ramos palmarum. And as the end a obvium as the moment pueri dicentes he gets we have to etc. Notice the way they uh, they draw the S's. Jesus. Uh, also this here, Acha per root. 
It's got the, the little tilde up there, so it's their abbreviation for the N Achaperu. That was quite a lot. Now, the way this would have been sung during this time in the 16th century, the 1500s, from Palestrina, Victoria, Palestinburg. And notice also, it's not a four line staff, it's a five line staff. It'd be like So, by the middle of the 19th century, chant was written and sung completely in heavy metrical rhythms. And actually, in some cathedrals, monasteries, whatnot, um, the lead cantor would have a type of uh, pole with some kind of uh, billow built into it, and he would tap it to keep to keep meter. And it would make this boom, 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 make this. Boom from the, the billows that were in it, that dictate the rhythm. But now we enter the period of restoration. The restoration of the chant began at the Abbey of Solem in the middle of the 19th century, specifically 1859. On July 11th, 1833, a young priest in the Diocese of Le Mans named Prosper Guéranger revived monastic life in France by restoring Priory of Solemn. It wasn't an abbey at that time, it was only a priory, which would soon be elevated to the status of an abbey with Guéranger as its abbot. Guéranger was not a musician, but a man of God, a man of taste, passionate for history and liturgy. Realizing the decadent life in the church at that time, especially in regards to its music, he wanted to return to more ancient forms of liturgy and especially Gregorian chant and he began the impetus of the Gregorian Reformation. He made two principles as his basis. First, he demanded of his monks the respect of the primacy of the text, pronunciation, accents and phrasing, all safeguards and service of the prayer. And the second was the acquisition or copying of as many of the ancient manuscripts as possible in order to study them, decipher them, and restore the original melodies which, since the time of Trent, had been truncated. In 1859, Guéranger had placed one of his monks, Dom Josion, in charge of this task of copying and studying the manuscripts. And he gave him, as his assistant and pupil, Dom Joseph Potier, the one who would solve the first stage of deciphering the ancient notations and make the first stage of restored melodies. Don Guéranger, the reformer of Solem, Don Potier, the, the first one to make a, a deciphering of the notation, first restoration. 
Another very important figure to be mentioned here is that of Canon Gontier of the Cathedral of Le Mans. This is 1871, this is still the way chant is being sung in 1871, these heavy metrical rhythms, trunking and melodies. But this is by Rathsbone, and I believe Rathsbone was the one who had the contract with the Vatican producing chant books. Could be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure Rathsbone was one of the contract. When their contract ended, then the Vatican uh, started a new contract with Solem. There is the Abbey of Solem. Pastor Guéranger, the uh, former of Solène, first abbot. And this is Canon Gontier. From the Cathedral of Le Mans. Gontier was a close friend of Don Guéranger, because Guéranger used to be at Le Mans. And he often visited Solène and was among the first to hear the new way of singing by their monks. The first time he heard it, uh, he was struck with awe and was immediately convinced that this method was good and that the truth was at Solem and not elsewhere. And Don Guéranger encouraged him to continue his work of helping with the Restoration. In 1859, Canon Gontier published his Méthode Raisonnée, uh, the reasonable method, the, the primary method, which gave the same basic rules as those of Solem. One might say this was the first the first Solemn method uh, before the famous one of Don Mocaro, which came 40 years later. However, Gontier continually insisted that his method was not his own, but rather that of Solemn. In 1862, Don Potier, Don Potier mentioned earlier, the f made the first stage of deciphering the ancient notations by transcribing the nooms of the Cantatorium of St. Gaul. and placing them over the, uh, the first uh, the first notation um, with square notes and, and uh, musical staff from St. Gall. He took those two, the squiggly line notation, the staff notation, placed the squiggle lines over the square notes and realized, oh wow, now it's starting to make sense. You can see the shape of the melody of these squiggle lines uh, re re resembles the square notation uh, remarkably. But it remained an unfinished task to restore the melodies, make a true scientific work of comparing manuscripts from all over Europe. And it was Don Guéranger who had the intuition to initiate the formulation of this work. In regards to this work, he once said, Clearly, we can be quite sure sometimes that, in a particular composition, we have discovered the pure Gregorian phrase when manuscripts from several remotely separated churches agree on the same reading. And these are the founding principles of the Paleographia Musicale. Paleographia Musicale is the research center, of, uh, chant research center of Solem. And this is where the famous Dom Andre Makaro comes into the picture. Before entering the monastery, he was a cello player in an amateur orchestra. He entered the novitiate in 1875, and in 1879 he was made the assistant and pupil of Dom Patier. Don Mokoro realized that to achieve any complete archaeological restoration of Gregorian chant, it was the ancient manuscripts that had to be studied in detail, and in 1889, he founded the Paleographie Musicale and became the Abbey's first true choir master, Don Mokoro. This greatly expanded the size of their musical library and became the world-renowned house of Gregorian musicology. In 1914, Dom André Makaro resigned as choir master, and his assistant and pupil, Dom Joseph Gajard, took his place. This is a 
the paleography. Actually, see the picture on the right there. That's taken inside the paleography of Chicago. This here, uh, the entrance comes here. You walk in this way. This is to your right as you walk in. There's a picture of Mokoro up here. And then to your left is over here. The picture of Mokoro was taken back here on this corner. Manuscripts of various sorts. Rome, Oxford, Milan. And this is Joseph Dejar, his successor. Though Mokoro had already developed his Solemn method, at the turn of the century, uh, he developed it at the turn of the century. This wasn't officially published until 1934 under the title of Le Nombre Musical Gregorien, a study of Gregorian musical rhythm. His assistant and pupil, Don Gajard, would be the one to really promote this method and bring it to its world-renowned fame. Um, interesting side note, the method was primarily created not for the Abbey, but for all the other churches around the world. The Abbey the monks of the Abbey loosely followed the method, uh, but not entirely, uh, because they didn't need to. And I'll, I'll mention why in a little bit. <clears throat> One must realize the result of this production in its proper context. The restoration work of Solem, from its very inception, has always been based on the two primary criteria. Respect for the text, pronunciation, prosody, phrasing, and the careful, systematic, scientific study of the ancient manuscripts. One must always remember that in these early years, even at the turn of the century, the common practice of chanting was the old, heavy, metrical, ryth rhythmic way of singing, with truncated melodies. When a culture has become so ingrained in such a style, you can't expect them to automatically understand how to sing the restored melodies, long melodies, in a non-rhythmic fashion, without some help and direction. Some form of method was necessary and prudent to help break them of these bad habits and teach them how to sing less rhythmically and more freely. So if you consider a computer company such as Apple Macintosh, you know, when they started in the 80s, if you look at it now, and what they started with, according to today's standards, is extremely rudimentary. But they understood at that time, they produced their, their first product, and they knew it was good, but they knew in 20 years we would be making things so much better than this. But they didn't wait 20, 30 years to come out with their first product. They came out with their first product, and from there they improved upon it, improved upon it, improved upon it, improved upon it. So, it's not a perfect analogy, but it kind of fits here. Um, the same can be said about the Solemn Method. It was constructed as a stepping stone to help teach others to break free of this heavy metrical performance of the chant, yet it was itself another form of metrical performance. Um, I explained this to Dom Saunier. Uh, I told him, you know, I started, you know, years and years ago, I started learning the, the Solem method. Um, but then I stopped because it was so uh, difficult for me to really understand it and grasp it. Um, <laughs> and his response was, yes, exactly. Yes, um, this is because, uh, because you're a musician and the Solem method is not for musicians. It's, it's not musical, it's more for Mathematicians and people who, you know what, you know, it's not musical. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, I guess I don't feel so bad for not understanding it then, alright. Um, but at the turn of the century, even in the early 1900s, um, this was a good and prudent method when understood as a stepping to stone towards a more perfect natural performance. Um, to continue using it today is 
doesn't really make sense. You're taking a method which was created at the turn of the 19th to 20th century for the purpose of dealing with the way chant was being sung at that time. Um, we no longer have that issue of singing in this heavy metrical rhythm. Now the issue we have is singing according to the solemn met metrical rhythm. <laughs> you know, so it, it, it's much, much less biblical. Uh, uh, way less biblical than what it was before, but it's still uh, a form of metrical rhythm. And so now, um, I have to try to move on from there. Um, um, Don Gujard succeeded Mopero as the choir master of Solem, and though he realized the importance for the continuation of research, his own personal preference was to be a perfect disciple of Mopero. And since Gujard chose to limit his work to choir master, Mopero's successor as the head of the Paleograph Musical would be Dom Eugene Cardin and his two assistants, Dom Jacques Houllier and Dom Jean Clair. So very important names here of Solène are, of course, the founder of Guillaume uh, the first major reformer, Don Potier, then Don Mocaro, who really created the, uh, the method, Don Gajard, who promoted it, uh, developed it further, and now Don Cardin. Paul VI. Um, it was Don Cardin who in the 1960s finally made the monumental breakthrough in deciphering much of the meaning of the old notations and earned his title Father of Semiology. Uh, paleology would be the study of the signs of the old manuscripts. Semiology be the study of the interpretation of those signs. He was assigned by the abbot to teach at the Pontifical Institute of Sacred Music in Rome, the church's own official school of music, where he would later publish two textbooks based on his research. Which I brought with Beginning studies in Gregorian chant. For the first year students. And Gregorian semiology, which is much more in depth. That doesn't really deal with studying the old ancient manuscripts. This is entirely on the old manuscripts, primarily St. Gaul. St. Manuscripts of St. Gaul. Um, In 1971, after 57 years as choir master, Dom Gajard finally resigned and was succeeded by Dom Jean Clair as the choir master. Now, Jean Clair was a master in the study of the modes and who had produced the most famous recordings of Solem in the 1980s. After Cardin died in 1988, Dom Jean Clair took his place as director of the Paleographie Musicale. So, after Mokro, the duties of choir master and uh, musicologist separated. Gajard took choir master, Cardin took musicology. Um, after the one died and the other resigned, it now combined back into one person again in Jean Clair. And this is Don Jean Clair. In 1980, an engineer and flute player, Daniel Saulnier, entered the novitiate at Solem, and given his musicality, was placed as the assistant and pupil of both Cardin and Jean Clair. From Cardin, he studied semiology, from Jean Clair, he studied the modes, and for all else, he studied from Canon Jean Anto, another great musicologist, chant expert, and friend of the Abbey. Eventually, he was sent to the Sorbonne in Paris, for his doctorates in musicology, where he would soon after become world-renowned as the greatest authority on Gregorian chant. Uh, 
was Daniel Saulnier. This was about uh, 20 years ago, I think, about 1990. In 2007, he was sent to replace Alberto Turco and Nino Albarossa at the Pontifical Institute in Rome and would teach until 2011. Uh, so basically, he, Cardin was there, died, and then they had various other lay teachers teaching until he came to teach the chant. Um, this was in 2010, so that's essentially what he looks like now. 2010, it's 11. In 2011, he was transferred from Rome and now teaches at the Centre d'Etudes Supérieures de la Renaissance in Tours, France. Uh, Centre d'Etudes, it's like the, um, the Center of Superior Studies of the Renaissance. Um, that's where he teaches now. That's where I spent my summer in July studying with him, uh, along with Serge Ilg, who's a former singer of the Cathedral of Notre Dame of Paris, currently a director of several parts in Switzerland. Um, in 1996, Don Saunier became the fourth, uh, the third successor of Don Mocro and the fourth director of the Paleography Musicale. But just as Jean Claire was at first choir master while Cardine was the paleologist, Saunier would be limited to musicological research and the publication of new books, while another uh, work as a choir master. In 1996, after 25 years, Jean Claire retired, and Don Saunier succeeded him as the fourth director of Paléographie Musicale, while Don Richard Gagne succeeded him as choir master. And this is when the performance of the chant at Solem crashed. Uh, Gagne was not nearly as competent as any of his predecessors, and he also had kind of a bipolar disorder. Um, eventually, as the quality of performance got so bad, mostly due to his own doing, um, Sonia was telling me one day during, I think it was the office, they're all sitting in choir during the office, and He's got bipolar disorder, and the chant has just gotten so bad that eventually he just got so frustrated with it, he just yelled out, ah, and slammed his book down and walked out and left the Abbey and um, went and joined the uh, Abbey of Saint Benoit du Lac in Canada instead. Um, so he was then replaced by a friend of the Abbot, uh, Dom Yves Marie Le Lièvre, in 2003. was while I was there. In this picture he's, he's actually chanting the French version of um, uh, Frank Sinatra's My Way. <laughs> <laughs> I got a video of it too, it's pretty hilarious. Um, and he's, he's just like rocking out to it. Uh, Yves Marie is still not as competent, competent as Jean-Claire Saunier, uh, but much more so than Gagne was, and without the bipolar disorder. Uh, for whatever reasons, I don't know, um, he left the Abbey in 2011 and joined another one in Brazil. He was replaced by Dom Bruno Lutz, who is the current choir master, uh, whom I know nothing about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because that happened after I was there. Um, so now I just got some other photos of Salem here. So I don't want to this is in the um, the private uh, cloister courtyard. This is their um, chapter room where they uh, have their meetings and every day. Uh, one of the interior um, cloisters. And the beautiful, magnificent uh, chapel. Rather small compared to some other ones like Fontainebleau, but 
the stone is just, as you can see, this wonderful cream color. And the weight of this, the, the type of stone as well as the architecture, when you're there, it just really has this beautiful, warm tone to the sound. Fantastic. Choir stalls, fifteenth century choir stalls, all these cardinals of saints and whatnot. These are fifteenth century carvings from Italy. So that brings us to today. Um, I have a couple of books here. Um, this is the latest publication from Solem, the Antiphonale Romanum II, although this is the first one published. They're still waiting for Antiphonale Romanum I to be authorized and published. Uh, but this is all the, the work of Don Sonnier. Um, I forgot to mention the last class, the, the first few classes here, I'm, I'm drawing heavily from this book, Gregorian Chant, A Guide to the History of Liturgy, by Dom Saunier, translated by Dr. Mary Berry. Um, it's, it's really a, a wonderful book for uh, an easy introduction to uh, the history of the chant and whatnot. Um, there was a previous edition of this translated by uh, Edward Schaefer, I think, but there were a lot of complaints about that one because, not because anything was incorrect, but because it was a very literal translation which made it difficult to read. And so then they um, had it retranslated by Dr. Mary Berry, um, and it's fantastic. Um, also, Another very important part about chant is its spirituality, which um, I don't, uh, I'm not uh, the one to speak about spirituality, um, but there's this short little book by Dom Jacques Houllier, the um, assistant to Dom Cardin, called The Reflections on the Spirituality of Gregorian Chant. It's a wonderful book. Uh, uh, all of these books are available on Paraclete Press. Paraclete Press is the... Uh, I'll leave these out so you check them out. Um, they're the, dis the, the official distributor in America for uh, all of Solemn's publications and whatnot. Uh, but to close, I'd like to bring up some points. Uh, last week, there were um, some questions about uh, Gregory the Great and some hesitation. Uh, last week I mentioned how Pope Gregory did not actually compose the music as was often thought, but that it was very much completed, uh, some of it was completed before him, but then especially after him when he instituted the, the scola. Uh, and then it was you know, mixed uh, with the Gallican chant and that created the Gregorian chant. Um, there was some hesitation on that, some other questions raised, so I just, all I'm going to do is I'll point out some historical facts, and then based on those facts you can decide for yourself whether you think it fits uh, with the story of him proposing it or not. Um, so some of the problems with this idea and theory of Gregory the Great composing are these. For one, he's a pope. As pope, he has too many other responsibilities of governing the entire church to compose music. Uh, especially because Rome at that time was in both physical and religious danger, 
having been sacked twice within the last 100 years and was now in danger of the Germanic Lombards who were invading Italy and were supporters of the Arian heresy. So that alone puts a lot of pressure on Rome and the papacy. Two, musical notation didn't exist. He would have had to uh, teach the melodies, uh, melodies orally to all of his singers and then hope that they could remember them, and retain them, and sing them the way he taught them, which takes a lot of time. Um, in addition to that, to having to teach them orally, the repertoire of chants contains thousands of pieces. Uh, logistically, the, the time it would take to teach singers thousands of pieces of chants, even in a you know, uh, uh, time period of oral transmission, um, would take years and years and years of so for, for someone who's dedicated to music, not, not let alone a pope who's got a thousand other different duties. Um, also, he's a doctor of the church due to many writings um, on theology and commentaries on the books of the Bible. He did write a lot, but he never wrote about music. Interesting for someone who supposedly wrote music. If he did compose, he would have had only 14 years to compose thousands of chants in addition to his other duties. St. Hildegard of Bingen, in her 67 years in a convent, was only able to write 159. Also, Gregory was often ill, sometimes unable to get out of bed even for Mass. It also cuts into time. The, uh, th th this is a very key point here. The earliest mentions of him composing chants have anything to do with that. The earliest mentions come from the late 8th and 9th centuries, two to three hundred years after him, and coincidentally, at the very same time Charlemagne, Charlemagne is trying to adopt the Roman liturgy and get the people of Gaul to adopt this new form of chant. And he's claiming that it's written by Gregory. It's the first time any mention of Gregory composing music appears it's at that time. Um, also, Gregory helped convert England via St. Augustine of Canterbury. The English were very proud of their Gregorian heritage, but they never claimed he wrote chant. In St. Bede's History of the English Church and People in 731, she never refers to him in this way. Also, it can be demonstrated by internal analysis of the melodies that this was not something which was composed at one period of time. It was something that developed over many centuries. And the Gregorian chant we have today, remember, is a hybrid Roman and Gallican chant. So if anything is Gregorian chant, it would be the old Roman chant. But there are reasons to, understandable reasons why this was, uh, this belief happened. Gregory was a pope and a saint and one of the most famous of that time. He was the most recent pope to make a significant revision of the liturgy in Rome, and thereafter the liturgy was referred to as the Damasian Gregorian liturgy. He very likely instituted the Roman Schola cantorum for the purpose of composing and elaborating chants. So you could say he's responsible for the composition of the chants, the Roman chants that is, but not by himself, but by, by his institution of the Scuola Cantorum. Um, he wrote several prayers for propers of the Mass and sacramentary. His sermons were drawn upon regularly for the nocturnes of the night office of Matins. He regulated the use of the Alleluia as a suffix to the prayers in Easter season and approved the singing of the Kyrie with uh, Latin verses for festal days, uh, while ferials were only in Greek. Now here's another key point of why his name was affixed to this 
we do hybrid chat. There's an old story, uh, I've to, there's a famous painting of this too. There's an old story of this dove perched on his shoulder. Um, and the dove is a symbol of the Holy Ghost, divine inspiration. The story of this dove perched on his shoulder, whispering into his ear, supposedly the chant that he writes down. There's belief, well, what about, you know, angels? Angels appeared to him and gave him the music. And like, angel, what's his name, gave Joseph Smith the golden tablets, you know? And then they mysteriously disappeared. Um, well, where does the story of this dove perched on his shoulder, whispering into, you know, divine inspiration into his ear, where does that come from? It is a very old story, and we know where it comes from. It comes from uh, a monk of Whitby in England, and um, in, uh, he wrote this between the years 704 and 714. And what he writes in this story is he tells of this dove sitting on his shoulder, whispering divine inspiration into Gregory's ear. But it wasn't music. It was divine inspiration for Gregory's commentary on the book of Ezekiel. Which then later, either the people you know, trying to, to say that this music is written by Gregory, either they intentionally change the story to say, oh, well, you know, that story, yeah, it's, you know, divine inspiration singing the, the, the melodies into his ear. Either they did that intentionally or they just got the story wrong. But anyways, it was a very uh, convenient little story to help in that. And ever since then, it's, it's you know, people have thought of it as you know, the dove whispering the music into his ear. Um, and then, of course, Gregory helped convert England via Augustine of Canterbury. Charlemagne's, I remember the English were very proud of their Gregorian heritage. Charlemagne's personal liturgical advisor was Alcuin of York, an, an Englishman. Um, so there's um, a lot of different uh, problems with that theory and understandable reasons why it came about. You can decide for yourself uh, whether you believe it or not. And um, I meant to read this. It's just uh, I'll uh, read this next time. But this is uh, important as well. I wanted to do it in this one because of the uh, context, of the span of the history. But I'll do it in the next one. All right, I think that'll um, close us off for tonight. Uh, sorry for the late start and I think overextended time, but anyways. So I close the prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. St. Gregory, pray for us. St. Cecilia, pray for us. King David,